it all started with um, SR is uh, trying to think chaos is the first principle, right? Um, it's a chaos first principle, right? Uh, I'm going to start operating uh, a particular application and then chaos should be in the first in terms of, you know, my preparedness. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 67, orchestrating chaos on Kubernetes using Litmus Chaos. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Now, if you've been listening over the past few weeks, we're going to step away from serverless for this episode, maybe for a couple others. In fact, I know we are based on the calendar I just looked at. Don't worry, we'll come back to serverless. Right, Victor? Oh, yeah. Okay. But today, we're venturing back into chaos. When is our show not chaos? But no, we're talking about the legitimate chaos. Uh, Today, we have Uma from Maya Data. Did I say that right? Yes, Darren, you did. Okay, good. All right, just making sure. He's a co-founder and COO at Maya Data. Uma, I'm not even going to try your last name. Nor am I going to try your first full name. <laughs> so I want you, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Thanks, Darren and Victor. Uh, my name is Uma Mukara. I'm a co-founder, CBOVO at MyData. Uh, we started MyData uh, almost four years ago to solve the problems for SRE around stateful applications and in general about DevOps. Today, here, I'm going to talk a little more about uh, Litmus, the chaos engineering project from MyData, which we recently donated to CNCF as a sandbox project. So it was accepted as a sandbox. That's right? correct. Okay, let's, let's, I've got two things, and you can do them back to back or Victor may interrupt, I don't know. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead and explain what Litmus, what, because we've, we've talked about chaos toolkit. We've talked about powerful seal. What, what is Litmus chaos? What is, what's sort of its role in the whole ecosystem? And I'm also curious, what was the process like about donating it to CNCF? Sure. I can cover both the topics. Um, So first on Litmus Chaos, Um, why Litmus Chaos and uh, why we started it? Uh, Probably that gives you an answer, right? Um, Litmus Chaos is an end-to-end framework for doing chaos engineering in a native Kubernetes way. Um, Let me explain what is native Kubernetes way and why we call it as cloud native chaos engineering, right? So everything about uh, Kubernetes is being cloud native, right? It has to be completely helpful in automating whatever either the developer or SRE um, does, right? So when we were um, developing the automation framework or the test framework for our earlier project, OpenEBS, almost uh, two and a half years ago, um, we tried to build chaos engineering into our operations um, and also into our open ABS CI CD. We tried to look for um, chaos tools uh, that can be used on uh, Kubernetes. Um, it was not very surprising because Kubernetes was uh, early enough. Um, we did not find 
a very native chaos tool set that we could use. And then we started writing on our own. And uh, at the same time, there was this concept of um, custom resources and operators and lifecycle management of any application that was all coming up. So it was the right time that uh, we said, look, Kubernetes is getting adopted more and more. And um, the only thing that helps to fast fasten this um, adoption and also to make sure that the users, the SREs are comfortable with whatever they've deployed is to have a good tool set to practice chaos engineering, right? So that was the intention of um, uh, starting uh, Litmus uh, almost uh, two years ago. And then now today it is uh, completely declarative in nature. It's got the set of tools that you require to automate chaos in a Kubernetes native way, which means that uh, you can pick up a chaos experiment, set few variables in your YAML file, and off you go. The chaos operator picks it up and does what it's supposed to do and gives out the results in a custom resource form. So if you are an SRE or a developer on Kubernetes and you know how to develop or operate things on there, you don't need to learn anything new to manage chaos. Litmus is just the same way as you manage uh, other applications. So that's that's what um, Litmus uh, we started with. And also in the initial days itself, look, you know, I know about my set of applications at that time, OpenEBS and I can write uh, chaos experiments. But in our operations, we were using a lot of other microservices in the cloud native environment itself. A lot of databases, Nginx proxy, Kubernetes itself. These were totally new to us uh, in terms of operating them uh, in a proper way. So how to chaos test them, right? I didn't have chaos experiments uh, for those applications as well. So what we started doing is, uh, let's actually put together all these chaos experiments uh, in a central place and we call it as chaos hub. It's called as Litmus Chaos Hub and uh, it's like a Helm hub, right? So all these developers, uh, they have these images, artifacts pushed into a central place. Similarly, if you are doing chaos engineering on Kubernetes, you need to have experiments. You don't need to spend like first 10, 10 weeks writing, developing these experiments even before you start practicing chaos. It should be easy enough for anybody on Kubernetes. So with that intent, we started Chaos Hub. Right now it's got about 29 experiments. Uh, we got good traffic being pulled. Uh, um, the experiments are being pulled and being run. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good story. Uh, that's where we are on Litmus uh, Chaos. And um, hopefully that answered your first question on Onto your second question on sandbox, it was um, uh, there was a process uh, a discussion going on into sandbox uh, for almost like um, three to four months or maybe a little bit more than that. Fortunately for us, we are uh, late entrant into that process. It was around the time where they decided, hey, this is the new process and it's much much simpler. So our entry into sandbox was. Um, um, really seamless. Uh, the special interest group was very, very helpful. And the TOC made it very clear. This is exactly, they actually put out the things on a Excel sheet. Uh, these are the 10 conditions or eight conditions uh, that you need to uh, satisfy in order to get into sandbox. And then we did uh, satisfy all those conditions and it was easy enough. We did wait for about three months, but uh, that was purely about um, getting the process standardized. If I was uh, getting in now, it could take much lesser time than that. But we're very happy with how CNC, CF, DOC, and the SIG uh, has dealt with uh, this uh, project so far. What is the rest of the process? How do you get graduated? Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, that process is also very clear, uh, right? Right now, it's about um, finding a home that is vendor neutral in terms of governance, right? I mean, vendors are still going to put the resources, develop, but it, it is about governance of the project, right? 
and we have chaos hub chaos experiments as well as um, uh, the infrastructure to uh, manage build and manage chaos and monitor chaos all that is good and um, the most important stuff for us uh, right now is to go to the community tell them that this is a vendor neutral governance adhering project and then you can bet on this uh, chaos hub and chaos infrastructure and you adopt them and also we would we should get more contributors uh, coming in and contributing chaos experiments as well as uh, to the core project itself actually uh, on that front uh, it's good news we have um, maintainers from intuit and uh, amazon uh, ring central already into that uh, there was a maintainer that who recently joined amazon so we can say that uh, we have a maintainer from amazon but um, it's it's a, it's good uh, to have already four different maintainers from four different companies and we are in sandbox so it's about real adoption right now we need to get another uh, 10 12 different companies using litmus uh, in production and then we are good to go for graduation and from there it's about um, and CNCF does due diligence in terms of talking to the end users, how they're using, is it being uh, governed neutrally, are they doing monthly calls uh, in an open way, is the roadmap being um, discussed and prioritized as per the community uh, wishes, uh, not um, biased by one vendor. So this is a kind of a proven process and then they open it up for um, open it up for uh, public comments if all good then you you're going to get into incubation and then from graduation it's it's more adoption and more people are banking on it it's naturally accepted as uh, one of the projects for chaos engineering and it it need not be the project right uh, for example um, envoy proxy has uh, equivalent other options in the graduation level as well or incubation level so you can have more choices but the proof is needed in terms of being accepted as um, a, a, as a good project or well adopted project and then we are good and I'm pretty uh, sure uh, with chaos engineering being the need for almost every SRE and Kubernetes we're going to get good adoption and um, being part of sandbox helps to start the journey on a very positive path. So there is one thing that I'm kind of curious about because I feel that nobody really is tackling it or, or solving it. That is, so all the tools that I've seen more or less use a similar logic that there is some state that you define, you check it before some actions, you perform some actions, and then you check the state after, right? I believe that you call it entry and exit criteria or something like that, right? Now, what is complicated for me is that actually the exit criteria is usually not that simple, right? Okay. Uh, let me give you, let me think of an example. Let's say that you destroy a pod, right? You would create an experiment that says uh, the pod is running, then you do some action like destroy the pod, and then you do some exit criteria pod is running. It was recreated by Kubernetes or what's not, right? Now, what I kind of feel that we are missing in general, not, not with lit Litmus, but in general, is that systems are not that simple. Like if I destroy a pod, and I'm using a simple example right now, it is likely that actually what uh, what I will experience is that some other part of the system broke somewhere outside of what I'm directly observing. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Yes. Is that something that we are looking into observing, maybe connecting with other tools or what's or not? Yes. No, thank you, Victor, for asking a very important question. I was actually going to speak about it as one of the differentiators about uh, Litmus, um, but um, let me speak a little bit about that, right? The entry and exit criteria um, and how architecturally we started 
um, attacking that issue, uh, it's not completely solved. If I say that, hey, hey I solved that problem, then you know, we would be uh, <laughs> the most famous one and probably adopted by thousands of customers already, right? So uh, it's not completely solved, but uh, we have the architecture for that. And uh, let me explain what I meant by that. So the, uh, as you rightly said, when you kill a pod, uh, a pod is being lost, it's probably because of something else, right? Uh, the resources are not there, pod, pod is evicted, or there is software issue, it crashed, or there is a memory issue and then you know um, it got into some issues, right? Or there is some other chaos, right? So that is kind of an entry, right? So what exact chaos do you introduce? Is it enough to have a pod kill, container kill, network loss, network uh, corruption, disk loss, disk uh, uh, fill, all this, we call them as generic experiments, right? Is that enough? Uh, our answer is no, that is not enough because Applications are totally different. These are generic resources, and these are usually the end result of some other issue, right? So you need to actually introduce the fault uh, that would have otherwise originated uh, in a given application. Uh, let me give you an example. I can take OpenEBS, right? So OpenEBS faults could be some other uh, problem in iSCSI target, right? Can you introduce that fault? Right, uh, the developers of OpenEBS or developers of uh, MySQL DB knows what could go wrong in a code. So they could start writing that experiment. Let me introduce a possible chaos. In these conditions, this fault can happen. So now I know how to simulate that, ha that condition, right? So that's the reason why we have created application-specific chaos, right? And that's the reason why Chaos Hub is there. It's not about the 10, 12 experiments that everyone else is talking about. It is about how to generate application-specific experiments and then no one can write all, right? So each vendor or each developer knows their application best. And if it is an open application and if it is on the cloud native environment, you can write that negative test case as chaos and then push it up to the hub. So at least you're covering how to inject that part um, specifically, right? That's on the entry conditions. Now on the exit conditions, it's even more difficult problem. Well, you have injected a specific chaos. Now, how do you know that everything is working fine? How do you know what to check, right? So that's where we have given a kind of a, a pluggable interfaces to the experiments. In the YAML file, you can go and define, hey, this is what we think are supposed to be checked. Right? When a MongoDB goes down, uh, a specific chaos in MongoDB goes down, you know exit conditions as uh, what to be checked, whether MongoDB is behaving properly or not. But it does not cover what is the exit condition of an application that is using MongoDB. Right? And then you can write that exit condition in a declarative way. Right? You can write a script and attach that. Here is the regular exit conditions and let me add another exit condition because my application is using MongoDB, right? And that's how we are uh, covering the exit conditions also. And uh, that framework uh, is there and we have a few set of applications. We have developed OpenEBS as an example uh, infrastructure that can use better exit conditions. But as Litmus gets adopted more and more, um, people will write these exit conditions to what they think should be better exit conditions and they could upstream those uh, conditions up to the hub so that it gets used by others. So that's our approach, Victor. Good question. I do agree, up to a point, to be honest. What bothers me more is that still, when we talk about exit conditions, we are talking about mostly about exit conditions that I predict, right? I'm much more interested in things that we cannot predict easily. In a way, so what I would really like to see us or think would be very useful is if tools like that could hook into others, let's say Prometheus or maybe Datadog or something like that, and say, okay, was there an anomaly in a system that is not something that I predicted, not anomaly in this application, this pod, this database, but is there some... Did this experiment create some anomaly that you can detect with those other tools, whatever they are, right? 
tool speci- specialized in monitoring the system rather than a uh, specific application, like like Datadog or Prometheus or, you know, there are many others in, in the market. So I think that that kind of would be, you know, the the cherry on top of a cake. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. This uh, metrics or the crux of observation, right? Um, it's all about introducing chaos and then being able to predict through observation that, hey, things are okay or not, right? Um, and also it comes with a lot of um, training of the data. So we are hoping at some point when we have enough data coming in, uh, there could be possibilities of uh, machine learning of uh, uh, of the metrics uh, based on what we've been observing, I think you're good, right? So for example, on a well-working system, I have observed this Prometheus metrics to fall into certain criteria. Now on another system, I'm not uh, seeing them uh, for the same conditions. So there is a possibility that uh, there is an anomaly, right? And um, it's it's some time to go there, uh, Victor. And uh, it's a it's a great topic, and it is a science, chaos engineering, and then the amount of applications that we are seeing, uh, the fail paths that can happen. It's a huge area. So we first covered the basic infrastructure. We are uh, gathering the community together. We want community to give us more ideas. And uh, uh, with with uh, more participation, I'm sure there will be more ideas to tackle this. And uh, what do you think? Kind of, maybe you disagree with me, right, on this one. But I, I feel that chaos engineering is maybe unjustly still not main. Uh, it's not you know the big topic. There are no big pl- so. The, the, Actually, let me rephrase that. The way how I see usually is that something becomes mainstream when that something sparks interest of, uh, you know, big players. Uh, Usually we can see, like with Kubernetes, we can say that Kubernetes became mainstream really when Google and and Microsoft and Azure, uh, sorry, and, and AWS took sufficient interest in it and then created their own services. Uh... Kind of, what, what what do you think about that? When do you predict uh, chaos will become a big deal, if ever, or maybe it is already? Um, it is to some extent, uh, but not super popular. Uh, good news is that uh, there is a lot of uh, positive advocacy coming from Amazon. Uh, you you can see uh, a lot of people from AWS or uh, good speakers on uh, chaos engineering, right? It uh, in Hornsby or Cockroft um, and who are part of, you know, like very active members of CNCF as well, right? And um, yeah, I mean, the CNCF SIG, App Delivery SIG itself uh, has unanimously uh, voted for Litmus Chaos primarily because chaos engineering is a need in the process of application delivery, right? So there is a good acceptance of the need for chaos engineering. And then this is how it all starts, right? So now people will adopt more and uh, after we have announced uh, uh, Litmus in uh, Sandbox, being part of Sandbox, there are uh, good um, pings coming from uh, EKS customers on AWS. That means people are looking for it. And the moment there is a, a, a open governed project, right? That's what is cloud nativity is about nowadays. And uh, there will be adoption, right? So we honestly felt uh, a more generic Kubernetes native way of doing things. The moment you, you put it out there, it's a matter of uh, adoption going slowly and then it just goes viral. And I'm pretty sure in about uh, a year, uh, one or two vendors will start serving um, chaos as a service inside Kubernetes. And uh, at my data, we have already been talking to some large system vendors uh, many service providers who are uh, going to include chaos uh, as a part of a many service to their Kubernetes services. So it is happening. Uh, it's not mainstream yet, right? Uh, but it's only a matter of time. So it, it gives us a good opportunity to part of uh, to be part of that uh, that wave. So, although you've got vendors 
that are looking at embedding, let's call it that, my word, not yours, um, it's still going to be developers that, although there there is this library of different experiments that can be run, businesses are going to say, like, well, I need these other 15 different experiments. But our developers can't do it because they're too busy doing the more important things. How do you see the landscape of chaos experiment development starting to change over the next 12 months? 12 months. Um, I would actually say it's a short time. <laughs> I would probably say it. 24 months is a good, uh, uh, I can take a shot at it because uh, 12 months uh, you, you cannot predict, uh, you know, a general prediction, right? So again, very great uh, question, Darren. Um, chaos is, people are afraid of introducing chaos, right? Um, it all started with um, SREs uh, trying to think chaos is the first principle, right? Um, it's a chaos first principle, right? Uh, I'm going to start operating uh, a particular application and then chaos should be in the first in terms of you know my preparedness right and uh, SRS should think or will think that my developers should be afraid that I might introduce chaos it's not just a fault is going to happen but SRS are going to induce faults right so that is another theme or um, a general phenomena that is happening and we've been talking to many SREs and then uh, they are saying that, yeah, I'm pretty convinced. My SRE team is pretty convinced that uh, chaos is needed. Uh, right now we are buying in from the management that can we introduce chaos, not only into staging, but into production. And then um, most of the resistance comes from the development teams, right? So when do you talk to the management? So it is going to happen. And uh, um, it, it, it is a slow process. And as you get uh, this chaos adopted into the staging environments, pre-production environments, they get an idea of the real benefits of chaos engineering. The developers, hey, you found an issue even before you got into production. So thank you very much. And it's not my CA scripts that have uh, found uh, the issue uh, in, in my code, but rather, it is uh, the chaos engineering managed by the operations guys, right? So that is going to happen. And uh, on the time required for developing this chaos experiments, it's mostly the SRE team that needs to develop new chaos experiments, uh, not the developers themselves, uh, at least to begin with. And that's the idea of giving these experiments. You don't need to develop 50, you got 25 or 30 of them already available you can start and then in a period of a uh, uh, few months you can add more experiments uh, for your stack right and it is a process and um, the good news is that I mean that's where we have invested uh, more uh, because every time when we talk to open EBS uh, admins or SREs they were saying that how can I do a failure testing on your code and make sure that you are very res resilient, right? So that's when, okay, we need to practice. Show me the chaos engineering that you've been using in OpenEBS for me to deploy your stuff, right? So these are the questions that are coming from SREs. And um, I'm very hopeful that uh, it is going to go into mainstream. And uh, the moment um, Kubernetes distributions start adopting chaos as one of the requirements, right? It's, it's a matter of time. If one distribution says that, hey, we deploy and also we provide chaos engineering as an added service into your deployments, right? Uh, just like everybody embraced Helm uh, and uh, apply operator deployment, operator lifecycle management as one of the services of uh, either Kubernetes service or distribution, chaos is very much in line with it. And then people will fall in line. And uh, hopefully my prediction is right. <laughs> So basically you're saying you're wanting litmus chaos to be the next core DNS. You can't have a cluster unless you have litmus chaos running. Uh, yes. Uh, by the time it gets to graduated, hopefully that's where we would be. <laughs>
And to go back to the beginning, you wrote Litmus Chaos in order to solve your testing for open EBS or your so let's even though we're not going to talk about open EBS, how is that directly? How has having the the trust because of the chaos test you have against open EBS, how has that helped you in I'll say it, pitching open EBS to people? How is that confidence, that level of confidence, instead of saying, hey, I've got this great way of doing stateful sets, um, but you know, sometimes we have some weirdness happen. How did you solve that? Yeah, it's about being transparent and being open, right? I mean, you can tell 100 different things until they see you doing that, uh, the community will always have a doubt, uh, is this a, 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 a marketing pitch or a sales pitch or are they really doing it, right? So we started breaking open EBS through Litmus, uh, through chaos experiments, and we actually put it, the entire process of our pipelines, uh, the breaking of code inside the pipelines in open as well. So we call it as openebs.ci and we told the community that uh, this is how inside the pipelines and in um, long running test cycles, we are using Litmus to break different negative uh, scenarios, to introduce different negative scenarios inside the open EBS path. And we're still able to uh, get um, get some outcomes that um, uh, a bug is not there or you configured properly, right? So that is, that's well accepted, uh, I would say, and uh, that is served as a, a good proof point as well. And uh, also to us, right? Um, it's not only that open EBS CI uh, platform, which is an open one. We also have another SaaS platform. Uh, now we call it as Kubera and uh, the operations of it, uh, we dog food uh, open EBS to that, right? As a stateful uh, storage. And um, so we have a big SaaS platform where open EBS is being used and we use Litmus to break things underneath, right? Uh, so uh, once or twice uh, it has taken a hit, uh, the SaaS platform went down primarily because there is chaos underneath, right? So we're not afraid to do uh, such kind of experiments and it's, uh, it's only a matter of time where things get uh, better and better and um, Litmus is definitely helping achieve that goal of resilience. So for your SaaS, you are running are running Litmus Chaos in production? Yes, that's how it started. It's almost 30 years now. <laughs> so you went out of the gate with Litmus Chaos running in production? Mm -hmm. we, we started with that, right? I mean, OpenEBS is another project and we want to use it uh, ourselves, right? And uh, if you are the guy behind it. And uh, we started writing chaos tests. Litmus is born actually after that. So the first tests were actually put into production and then we felt, hey, we could actually put it out and make it as a project. And uh, we saw an opportunity to uh, build some kind of a business around it. And uh, the first thing is build the technology in open, right? So it all started from there. You're a brave man, but you had to do it. Yeah. Right. You, there's no way you could tell other people they need to do it if you're not going to do it yourself. Dog footing. Hmm. Victor, do you have anything else for Uma today? No, I think I'm good. You think you're good. I I cannot know for sure, but I'm good. <laughs> it's uh, it's a mystery. I will most likely come up with uh, 15 seconds after we close. But, oh, why didn't I? That's life. Well, you if you have a Kubernetes cluster, try it out, induce some chaos and see how it's going on. I mean, it's pretty easy to induce chaos, uh, at least the first ones. There are more complex chaos possible, but um, the first ones are very easy. So actually, I do have a question. Uh, is the goal of Litmus to run on Kubernetes or to target Kubernetes? Um, both. Um, there, are, there are two goals. One is to find weaknesses in the Kubernetes platform itself. It's not about code inside Kubernetes, 
but how you configure Kubernetes, right? Uh, Kubernetes can scale up to uh, hundreds of nodes easily in a real production, uh, and then have you configured all the services that keep running Kubernetes properly, right? So we call it as platform, uh, Kubernetes platform chaos. And then comes the applications. There are thousands of applications that run on them. And then there will be different SREs that uh, manage. For example, you take Kubernetes as a service, right? Uh, Amazon EKS. So Amazon could use uh, a type of chaos to make sure that their service runs fine. And then the users who use EKS also will need chaos to make sure that their application is configured properly. And then my underlying support system uh, is is behaving the way I expect, right? So kill a node, and that's good. But um, killing a kubelet service uh, or killing a, a HCD, one of the pods inside the HCD, um, has to be done by the Kubernetes service provider so that you know in the eventuality of a fault happening in the EKS or uh, GKE, uh, Kubernetes continues to run fine, right? So there are various levels of chaos. Yeah. But you're not targeting things outside Kubernetes, like, I don't know, like messing up directly with the storage, not with persistent volumes, right? It's uh, we are. Within um, the, the sphere of Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, Kubernetes hardware, let's say. the um, For example, we, we call it as inside the generic experiments, there is something called infrastructure experiments. We could go and kill a physical node. We can go and take out an EBS volume. We can go and induce a network latency into a physical network, right? Uh, but it is like a layer below the Kubernetes itself, right? Yeah, it is there. And then we have some examples out there already. Nice. Okay. Well, Uma, thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, for everybody listening, all of Uma's contact information will be down in the show notes. And also specifically a link off to litmuschaos.io. See, .io. We know they must be legit because they are a .io. <laughs> right? Come we are on. legit. We are a CNC oh, yeah. project now. Yes. Yeah. You're super. You're double super legit because you're a .io and you're a CNCF project. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, Darren and Victor. It's nice to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, growing the community in the chaos engineering space. Thank you very much. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. DevOps Paradox.